This was going to be trickier than I'd expected. This is the Western Wall in Jerusalem, a surviving trace of the temple of 2,000 years ago. This is now a plaza divided into male and female sections. Traditionally, Jewish men pray out loud here, but women are not allowed to. Hence the riot. It's forbidden for men to hear a woman's voice raised in song, and to do it in a way which is you know, sticking it in the face of the people who have observed it and died for it and lived that way for, since God given it to us over 3,000 years ago is offensive to these people, and that is why they're here making this noise. If we look at Miriam, the prophet, she would have been in administrative detention today for what she has done. She's taken the drum, she started dancing, dancing and singing in a holy place, God forbid. We, we didn't even try to do that. Um, she would have been in jail today. It seems that the Old Testament has had some serious editing. We don't even know why Moses' sister Miriam is called a prophet. None of her prophecies have been included. The religions based on biblical history, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, are always said to be male-dominated religions. But there seems to be evidence that the religion of ancient Israel was very different. There's certainly one mass of evidence that suggests the Bible does not accurately describe the religion of the Israelites. It seems pretty clear that throughout the time of the Old Testament, they did not worship just one God. The commonest religious objects found in excavations throughout Israel turn out to be these figurines, which are, to put it bluntly, idols. I was given a Bible when I was held hostage in Lebanon. There wasn't much else to read. My captors gave me the King James Version, which I'm now discovering can be a bit misleading. The word God in the English version is often something else in the original. The names used for God in the Bible are a strange mixture of things. It's as if they tried to assimilate all the different names from the local Canaanite culture and translate them into Jewish terms or Israelite terms. Uh, one of the most common names is Elohim, and uh, that is a plural form of, of a word where it's sometimes used to mean gods. I find this a bit surprising. The opening sentence of the Bible is one of the best known statements in the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in fact, the Hebrew word used for God is Elohim, which turns out to be plural. The grammar is very unclear. It says, the gods, he created the heavens and the earth. Why would it say that? We know now there were several gods, in particular uh, a dominant female deity who is named Asherah. That is the same name as the old Canaanite mother goddess in the years preceding Israel's origin in the land. Asherah, the mother goddess, belongs in a very different kind of religion from the one we associate with the God of Israel. She seems to have been the, the consort or the, the partner of the highest god in the pantheon. And she seems to have been worshipped widely. Most of the figurines we find emphasize fertility. They often have large breasts, there's pregnancy shown, um, nursing children shown. Uh, those kinds of figurines would tell us that she is a fertility goddess. There's precious little written evidence outside the Bible about religion in the days of the first temple. The name of God in Hebrew is written YHVH. It was probably not pronounced Jehovah, but Yahweh. Only one object has been excavated in Jerusalem with that name. This silver amulet is from the 7th century BC. Words from the Old Testament were faintly visible. Yahweh, lift up his face to you and grant you peace. But was Yahweh the only God being worshipped? This little ivory object dates from the 8th century BC and says, belonging to the temple of someone ending in H. It could be Yahweh, but his female counterpart Asherah also ends with an H. Evidence that Israelites worshipped Yahweh and Asherah appears on this stone, which Bill Deaver discovered in 1968. Dating from the same period as the ivory, 
it asks for someone to be blessed by Yahweh and his Asherah. Bill was so shocked, he decided at first to keep it secret. And when I first discovered that, I really didn't want to publish that as a young scholar. It was too controversial. But then in the 1970s, a second site was found by Israeli archaeologists, also 8th century BC, in the Sinai, and you have the same expression. Again, may X be blessed by Yahweh and his Asherah. The reference to Asherah is to the great goddess herself. So Yahweh did have a consort like all the other gods of the ancient Near East, at least in the minds of many Israelites. The discovery that there was a Mrs. God, a female goddess, for the Israelites in Bible times sounds quite shocking. I think for modern, modern Jews and Christians, it sounds like a huge shock because we've always thought this religion was monotheistic back to Abraham. But it's almost ridiculous to suggest you had, you had a single male God without a wife. How could you possibly guarantee fertility of crops and fertility of the land with a single person without a female partner. It's more ridiculous uh, to assume that than not to accept the fact that Israel had the same kind of structure as everyone else. The Bible does accuse the Israelites of often worshipping other people's gods, and Freud encouraged the view that ancient gods were based on sexual imagery. There was really a theory, maybe beginning of the 20s uh, already, that maybe the Canaanite uh, uh, cult was based on two elements. One of a masculine, uh, one masculine element, maybe represented by an erected uh, a stone or pillar, and the feminine object was a sacred tree, maybe. And so those two elements combined together in a worship place, maybe really uh, realized the, the idea of fertility, of the, the relation between uh, uh, man and wife, uh, and that's, that was a common idea. Phallic standing stones as male gods, tree-like nature goddesses bursting with life. This was a popular idea in the early 20th century. There was never any proof that the Canaanites did worship this way, but in the excavation at Tel Rahov, they have just uncovered a sacred spot that fits the description nicely. The only trouble is, it is not Canaanite. It comes from a date when Tel Rahov was, according to Diana Edelman, in Biblical Israel. This is Israelite. Diana, what have we here? Well, this is an altar uh, from somewhere between about 800 and 900 BCE. Mm -hmm. The actual altar itself are these stones here, right. which are unworked, just piled. And then we have this row of four uprights, so or at least three that are a little more upright, and, and this little low stone here. And these seem to be something which often is seem, seen to represent a deity. Right. And if this is true, we might have three deities here, or possibly four. Right. But who they are, we wouldn't necessarily be able to but tell. But if this is um, uh, 1000 or, or later than that, after the United Monarchy, we're talking about seriously Israelite times. It, it suggests that they're not worshiping one god, but, but a number oh, of deities. Oh no, we're we're we're. <laughs> this is um, it, we are in the time of the period of the Kingdom of Israel. In addition, there is a round hole here, oh, yeah. which the excavators say had some wood fragments in it, and there is a prohibition in the Book of Deuteronomy against erecting a pole for the worship of Asherah next to an altar for Yahweh. In the days when archaeologists in Israel were funded by Christian evangelists or Zionist organizations, they didn't seem to find much evidence of Israelites with pagan gods. But the excavation at Tel Rahov is funded by a detective story writer. I just came off the book tour in a week before we came over here. And uh, sometimes, you know, you're stuck in a hotel room in Los Angeles and you can't believe in one week you're going to be eating dust and, and all the sweat, but it's, uh, it's what I look forward to all year. Does the work here on the site uh, help with your, with your writing? I actually write here, in the, write here during the project in the afternoons. Uh, and a couple of people in the last few days started talking to me about what they thought really bad guys would be like. And it's starting to turn in my head. And I'm going to use some of it, I think. Uh, it just, it, it really sort of helped the last two days. I suppose I'm also looking at all this as a sort of detective story, involving some kind of mystery and hidden evidence. For instance, if the Israelites were worshipping Canaanite gods, you might expect these pottery goddesses to be even more common in the older Canaanite strata. 
Well, there was one. Every season we put the prize find from the previous season on our T-shirts. Uh, this T-shirt is decorated with a, a drawing of a clay pottery figurine found by us in 98 in this 10th century level. Our, we call it our city six, uh, the 10th century level. It shows a, probably a fertility goddess. We call her Ashtart, mm -hmm. the Ashtart figurine. Uh, she is very unusual, first of all, because we have very few figurines like this from 10th century context in this country. Most of them are later, from the 8th and 7th centuries. Very unusual. So most of these figurines come not from the Canaanite period, but from the years when there were established kingdoms in Israel and Judah. They were not simply imitating the Canaanites, they were doing their own thing. We don't have any evidence for the story that the Israelites came here from Egypt and conquered the land. And there are no sources outside the Bible that mention the great kingdom ruled by David and Solomon from Jerusalem. But according to the Old Testament, by the 9th century there was a northern kingdom called Israel or Samaria and a southern kingdom called Judah and those we do know about from other sources. The Bible also stresses that the Israelites worshipped the old Canaanite gods and were punished for it. The Canaanites' chief god was El, and he was worshipped as a bull. The Israelites also used the word El for God, and this is a bull found at an Israelite site. But then the Bible actually says that when Solomon's kingdom split and Israel separated from Judah, the king of Israel set up bull figures for worship at his northern and southern borders. It's just that the Bible says he shouldn't have done it. According to the Bible, Israel was deviating from the tradition of worshipping one God, and Judah was keeping the faith much better. But did monotheism exist at all at that time? The answer may have been found at Tel Arad. It's a kind of an ancient military base, uh, but um, as we go in, I will show you the most uh, important find there, which is probably, I would say, the only Judahite temple ever found. The only one? Only one. And the temple was built after the days of Solomon and David, and it went out of use probably in the days of Hezekiah, which is up to, let's say, 700 before the common era. We're going into this entranceway. And we are right now in the first part of the tree. The, the temple was three parts. Yeah. The first one is an open court, paved as you can see. And in the center of the court, there is the altar. The offering altar. Animals were slaughtered here. And burnt offerings were offered on top of the, uh, the uh, altar. And then as we approach into this house, house of the Lord, house of the God, uh -huh. most important part is of course the Holy of the Holies. Incense burners were on both sides of the staircase. And what, what, are the, what are those pillars at the back there? These are standing stones. No idols, no figurines, nothing of this kind was found here. It's a culture, religion without icons, which very much fits of what we know about, let's say, the Ten Commandments, for example, that idols was absolutely banned from the Israelite culture. The temple is very much according to the line of description of the of temple in, in Jerusalem. So this is it. The only temple that we have might be Yahwistic in practice. But it might not. We may have been staring directly at evidence of polytheism, worship of several gods. There were two, if not three, standing stones, uh, carefully smoothed and dressed, which clearly are what the Bible means by a standing stone that represents the presence of a deity. And the fact that you have two or even three again suggests polytheism. In fact, even the Bible's description of Solomon's temple is hard to reconcile with a religion that has no idols. It's more like the temples of other religions in the area. Uh, we're looking now at uh, a stand, a bronze stand coming from Cyprus, from the end of the second millennium. On it we can see a very typical Canaanite imagery of a combined animal, human and animal, 
uh, figure, uh, which maybe represents some sort of creature like the cherubs, which we find in the Solomonic Temple in Jerusalem. The Bible says that cherubs were placed in the tabernacle and then in the Holy of Holies of the Temple. And they didn't look like this. They were more like sphinxes. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The Bible doesn't need to hide the fact that the Jerusalem Temple's furniture contradicted the Third Commandment, but Diana Edelman believes that someone has altered the text to conceal the worship of the Mother Goddess. There are about 40 references to Asherah, and yet when you look at those references, you don't know you're really talking about a goddess. And so the later biblical scribes wrote her out as a goddess. They disguised her presence in the text. Apparently, when the hero Gideon is told in one story to destroy his family's shrine, the original instruction would have been, throw down the altar of Baal and chop up Asherah. But a scribe writing the book of Judges wrote, throw down the altar of Baal and chop up the Asherah. So simply by changing grammar, you would prevent anyone from reading the term Asherah as a proper name. In the King James Version of the Bible, when the translator did not know what an Asherah was, the word disappeared altogether. Throw down the altar of Baal and cut down the grove. And there are a number of references that say that this word Asherah, the Asherah, was cut down or was burned. So one of the possible meanings that came out of that was either a grove of trees or simply a tree. So there was a Hebrew goddess and she has been hidden. When did this happen? The answer seems to be connected with the temple at Arad, because the archaeologists found that this temple had been shut down, sealed, and deliberately buried in the 8th century BC. And the Bible itself explains why. King Hezekiah in Jerusalem launched a violent attack on the religion of his people. He took away the places of worship and smashed the images and dismembered the Asherah. Arad, the temple that we are standing in, went out of use deliberately. It was not burnt, it was not destroyed. It was all covered with uh, dust and sand deliberately by the people who get an order to do, uh, order to do that. Uh, the standing stone was put aside, the incense burners were put on the flat uh, side and it was all covered and went out of use deliberately, slowly, with no big uh, event, as a kind of an order to stop worshipping Yahweh in Tel Arad. This was connected with a disaster further north. In 722 BC, the Assyrian army wiped the northern kingdom of Israel off the map. Judah had to choose between defiance or submission, as thousands of refugees fled south into Jerusalem and there is clear evidence that Jerusalem suddenly began to become a large city. The city extends itself to the west, to the northwest, tremendously to what is today called the, the Jewish quarter inside the old city of Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, to that part and down to the east, to the valley, uh, so we have fortifications and houses, water installations or, or, or uh, systems uh, and other things, this is true. Um, this is, of course, because the population grew um, there in the 8th century um, and uh, for several reasons. Um, uh, one of them is, first of all, that um, refugees came to Jerusalem. According to the Book of Kings, King Hezekiah invited them to celebrate Passover there. And Hezekiah undertakes to centralize religion, the first king to do so, in Jerusalem. So this seems to be a pretty major reform. And it says that he closed down these local sanctuaries and he forbid them from worshiping with stone pillars and planting these Asherah trees. A few years later, under King Josiah, the attack on Asherah was relaunched with even greater vigor. And the king commanded the high priest to bring forth out of the temple of Yahweh all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the Asherah, and he burned them, 
and he brought the Asherah from the temple to the brook outside Jerusalem and burned it and stamped it small to powder. The prophet Jeremiah found there was tremendous resistance to this from many women. We will not hearken unto thee, but we will burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven and pour our drink offerings unto her, as we have done we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Men suddenly washed their hands of the goddess as though this had been a cult for women. Did we make our cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? According to the Bible, those women were deviants from traditional Israelite religion. Just as today, many Orthodox Jews regard women who demand to worship like men as deviants. It's coming, he, he want to. It's 50 years ago, it was 100 years ago, it wasn't 200 years ago. Of course. So it's, it's a break with tradition you don't like? Sure, it's not the way it's supposed to be. We read from the Torah, from the Torah scroll, and some of us wear prayer shawls when we pray, and, um, and we sing aloud as a group. Um, and that's what we want to be able to do at the wall itself. These women are not returning to the old Hebrew goddess, but I'm being told that the text from which they are reading was rewritten to conceal her existence, and that a combination of digging into the ground and into the text reveals a new story of biblical history. In that new story, there is no conquest, no Joshua, no worship of a single god. And yet the text carries a feel of authentic experience which is hard to dismiss. It describes a dedication ceremony as soon as they entered the Promised Land, binding the children of Israel to the one and only jealous God who led them. It was held at a great altar constructed on Mount Ebal. And if that story is fiction, then what in the world is this? Next week, I'm going to try to find out. <laughs>